Welcome to Concord Matters, a show seeking for Concord, agreement in Christian confession. Concord mattered to Jesus and Paul, and so it does to us also. Spend these next 60 minutes as we talk matters of Concord. Concord Matters, a program produced by the Christ-centered leader in confessional broadcasting, Worldwide KFUO, online at kfuo.org. And welcome to Concord Matters, the show where we seek to be of one mind, that is the mind of Christ, and to do that, a couple of Christ-confessing Concordians confer with the Book of Concord to inform what we believe, teach, and confess according to Scripture in our Lutheran Confession of the Faith. On today's show, we are going to discuss why Concord matters for the care of souls. I'm your host, Pastor Sean Smith, pastor of the Evangelical Lutheran Dual Parish of Emmanuel West Point in St. Paul's Wine Hill in Southern Illinois. And my companion, confessor, and conversation about this matter today is Pastor Brady Finner. He is the pastor of Messiah Lutheran Church in Sartell, Minnesota, and also notable for our show here today. Pastor Finnern is also a Collegium Fellow with Doxology, an organization that is dedicated to the pastoral care of souls. Pastor Finnern, welcome back to Concord Matters. Thank you. Great to be here. Well, it is always certainly a great joy to have you on. I've had you on before, really appreciated that. And especially today, as we begin a new series here on Concord Matters, for our regular listeners, you're going to notice a shift in the history of the show, not always myself as the host of the show. I came on first as a guest, kind of halfway, well, a couple years into the history of this show, and then eventually became one of the co-hosts and now full-time host of the show. But in the history of the show, we've gone through the entire Book of Concord. And so the show has been dedicated to reading through the Book of Concord and basically providing an audio commentary as we go. And that's great. And we'll maybe get back to that again at some point as well. But I think a good time, as we've covered all of the material in the history of the show, to do a little bit of a shift and take kind of a thematic look at things. Basically, a confessional principles, or as the name of the show is Concord Matters, why Concord Matters for different themes, topics of what we believe, teach, and confess according to Scripture, of course, in our Lutheran Confession of the Faith and also in our practice. And so really a great honor to have Pastor Finnern back on now as we make this shift. The first one that I want to kind of look at here is, as I said in the setup, Concord Matters for the Care of Souls. So Pastor Finnern, you're with Doxology. I said that's an organization dedicated to the pastoral care of souls. As pastors, we talk quite freely about the care of souls. But go ahead and give us why the care of souls. Why does the care of souls even matter? It matters because people need Jesus. Dr. Sinkbile, who is uh, well, he's now retired as the executive, he was the executive director and founder with Dr. Bev Yonke with Doxology, that he had said very well, and he tells me continuously about soul care is bringing Jesus to people and people to Jesus. As we know that Jesus Christ and him crucified is the foundation of our lives, of our theology, and the way and why we have church and how we do church. It all centers around Jesus and the forgiveness of sins that he gives. And it's important because there is a reality in our world that when you talk about pastoral care, is that easily can be muddled with a whole bunch of other things. Spiritual direction is out there, psychology, sociology, leadership social work, other forms of help that's out there that often will get lumped into pastoral care or care of souls. And there is a distinction there. As we talk about the confessions and how this relates to care of souls, I really wanted to start with how the care of souls is centered and grounded in the Word of God. In the small called Articles, Part 3, Article 7, it talks about God does not want to deal with us in any other way than through the spoken word and the sacraments. That is vastly different than talking to a psychology, uh, working with uh, leadership principles or a spiritual director or social work or any of those kind of agencies. When soul care comes, it's about bringing Jesus, the word, to people and in prayer, bringing people to Jesus. And this is something that is very important. The living and active Word of God is our foundation. And with that comes the confessions. The confessions are showing us what the Word of God means. So you bring all that together. It's very important for us to know where our foundation is, which is in Christ 
his word, because if we don't have those things, like if I go to the hospital or I'm visiting with somebody and I'm just giving them advice or quote spiritual advice, you may as well go to some spiritual person to give advice because they might give better secular advice than me. But our focus is always going back to Christ and his word. And I like how you bring in there the small called articles. That is exactly what this is all about and what I really want to focus on throughout all of these different topics and thematic approach that we're going to be doing in this new series. But it always comes back to the word and the sacraments. It always comes back to God's word. That's what our Lutheran confessions are all about. And I like how you're focusing us here that when that's what our Lutheran confessions are about, then that's going to inform how we do the care of souls. And so you've laid a good foundation for us here, and we're going to come back to this idea of where we see this in the Lutheran confessions. We still want to stick true to that as that's what our show is dedicated to, is looking at these Lutheran confessions. But go ahead and lay a little more groundwork here for us then. Go ahead and distinguish pretty specifically for us, if you can, what are we talking about when it comes to the care of souls? What is the care of souls? Okay, so now these distinctions, and first of all, this is a monumental task, and it's really fun to think about, and I want to encourage everyone that this is the beginning of our look at this, because it is a very big topic, and I believe it's very, very relevant to us why we have the confessions, why we use the confessions, and why we should continually preach in accordance with the confessions. So to talk about what is the care of souls, we will say it in a few ways, care or cure of souls, which brings us back to a German word named Zellsorger. And this is often, you'll hear this maybe a little bit, some older folks talked about their pastor being their Zellsorger, which means soul care or cure of souls. John Fritz in his pastoral theology talks about being a physician of souls. This goes back to the early church and how a pastor is called to a congregation to preach the word of God and to bring the sacraments for the cure of people's souls or to cure souls. So there's a few things we have to define when we look at this. So what's a soul? This is, I think this is a huge definition we have to have very clear because I remember one time I met with a local Lutheran pastor and I was just talking to him about his church and he was telling me about this, talking about my church. And I asked him, how big is your church? Which is probably one of the more dangerous things pastors talk about. But then he said, we have over 300 souls. And that was really the first time I had heard someone speak about their membership that way. You hear membership or worshipers, those kind of things. Then I realized I didn't really have a good definition of soul because either it's on a thriller movie where they say there's souls in this building like a ghost. Or you'll hear, remember growing up where people would say, well, dogs don't go to heaven because they don't have a soul. And I was like, okay, I don't know what that means, but I I guess I'll buy it. So what is a soul? Dr. Sinkbile, in his book, The Care of Souls, defines it because he lives with that tension of, well, we are physical like animals and we are spiritual like angels. But you can't really separate the two things. When we talk about a soul, when we try to talk about care, a soul is really the whole person, created by God the Father, redeemed by Christ the Son, and sanctified by the Holy Spirit. This shows us that when we are doing spiritual care in a congregation, we're dealing with the whole person, okay? Because it is a physical, a spiritual person, all put together into one. And so this has been monumental for me because when I think of people that I'm working with and, and I'm, I'm caring for is that you see them as a not as a person who maybe is going to help in leadership or a person who can help the membership roles or a person who will give more money or a sad person who needs to be happy or whatever it might be. But you see that person as one that Christ has died for. And when they present some of these issues or fears or whatever it might be, that you are going to care for them as one who needs spiritual care with the Word of God. I think I'll just reflect back on that there too, especially what you were ending with there. I would say that is a real tension for us in our especially modern culture, and it's probably been around for a while. But these expectations that come upon us, of course, both of us are pastors and we see this quite regularly. What is it we're doing when we come there as pastor? You know, a lot of times there's a lot of different expectations of what that entails. And I think our culture is also really struggling with this, especially I think about a lot of the nursing homes and hospitals and things like that are closed to us right now. 
And I recognize that you want to care for the body and they have a responsibility in those places to care for the body. That's their focus. But historically, again, this understanding of pastor as spiritual physician, we've always worked right alongside them because really even our secular research recognizes the soul and body are connected together, obviously, in this life. Mm -hmm. And so both impact one another and you need both. And to cut that off in our contemporary society just shows that we have completely lost this understanding of pastor as soul physician. And it's really distressing. And sometimes even our people sitting in the pews have this misunderstanding of what their pastor is for. And so it comes back to, you know, well, how much money does he raise for the church by being an engaging kind of guy or, you know, different ideas. I don't want to kind of go down that side tangent and so forth. But, and I've even wrestled with this in my own life. What do I need a pastor for? Even myself now as a pastor, what do I as a pastor need a father confessor or pastor for? Mm. And it really does come back to, again, soul care. I need a soul physician. And that's what your pastor's coming for. I'm not coming into that hospital room or making nursing home visits or caring for those sitting in the pews on Sunday or visiting their homes throughout the week and engaging them in the community. I'm not there to be your friend. I'm not there to be your rah-rah cheerleader to make us a big organization. (laughs) I'm there to care for your soul. Now, I want to be your friend. I want us to have a good relationship, and I want there to be, quote-unquote, success, but it's got to be grounded on that. Absolutely. And so I guess this can lead us then into the next kind of idea here then. If that is what we are identifying as the pastoral office, what then does soul care look like? What is soul care going to look like on the ground as we get going here? Very good. So yeah, we live in that tension. And so when we talk about the soul being the whole person, like I said, created, redeemed, and sanctified by our triune God, our interest is in a person and in terms of their relationship with God. I'm a little uncomfortable saying relationship, but for the sake of clarity, we'll use that. So to care for souls is how do they see their relationship with God? For all of us, we have symptoms that arise. Fear, anxiety, distrust, misery, a lack of faith, maybe say it, or even joy or sorrow. All these things are something that people will disclose to you all the time, even if they're not trying. We've made it a practice here in church in the office is that when someone comes in, they usually are seeking some kind of care. Not always, but they'll bring up something. A child who is struggling, their spouse is physically having an issue, they have an uncle who is struggling with this, whatever it might be. And we've made it practice to how can we incorporate prayer? How can we incorporate the Word of God into all of that? Because people are always bringing these things out, and we all deal with that. COVID has brought that out, the anxiety we all feel, the fears that we all have, the concerns that are all there, that the pastor is to be a person who listens and applies the word, law, gospel, appropriately, according to the needs of that individual. This happens in divine service and in word and sacrament, where you have, obviously, the whole full meal deal, if you will, where the word and forgiveness of sins and salvation is given to people. And then obviously in the individual guidance, counseling, confession, that happens as well. And so how does a pastor bring this individually? See, this once again goes back to how do people see you? Do you see people as ones who are anything other than one redeemed by Christ? And this has been a great help for me because for me to see people that way and also for me to emphasize what I'm here to do helps that relationship work, that they realize that I'm here to pray with them, that I'm here to bring the Word of God. And I noticed one time I visited someone and it took a time for me to get to the Word of God in our conversation and the person said, "Um, Pastor, are you going to read the Bible or not? Which reminds me that thankfully God is working through this. So every time we preach, have confession and absolution, give the sacrament, baptize, all of this, we look at it in light of how can I care and be a physician to these people? And this is immense work. John Fritz back in his pastoral theology writing writes about all the things that we're expected to do in soul care. And he actually has a whole section on Zelzorga in this pastoral theology book. You know, visiting people when they're sick, the dying, visiting the prisons, still struggling with mental illness, still struggling to find a diagnosis for their illness, poverty, addictions. I mean, he goes down a whole list to show us that this is something that is very 
taxing and very, very important, but also with the understanding that this is not us as a Zales Orger, but it's Jesus who is the actual source of the curing of your sins, and we lean on him to do all of this work. And that's the key thing here, too. Like I said, we're bringing Jesus to people and people to Jesus, and the emphasis is not on us, but it's on Jesus doing the healing. All right, so that's soul care, and wholeheartedly affirm everything you just said there. But how does this then relate to the Lutheran confessions? Because again, that's the main focus of this show, where Concord matters. We go through the Lutheran confessions. That remains the focus that I want to have, at least for this show, is how do the Lutheran confessions cross paths with what we believe, teach, and confess, and do in our practice of these different matters? And I think we're going to talk about, before the episode is done, how soul care is going to permeate all of the topics that we're going to address in this series. But especially as we continue to get going here with soul care, you've rightly identified that for us. How does this cross paths with the Lutheran confessions then? What are some places that we see that at work? Okay, so I would say that we typically see the Lutheran Confessions as almost a textbook because it's from the 16th century, so maybe it's a history. Um, Yeah, we believe, teach, and confess it. Yeah, but it's, you know, it's from the past. Or if someone says, what do Lutherans believe? We can pull the confessions out, lay it in front of them, and say, here it is. But when you read through it, especially through the lens of realizing that the Reformers had a very clear desire for the cure of people's souls— Like when you realize that scripturally and when you realize that confessionally, you do see it come full bore, I would say, in the whole confessions. When you read it, you see these two things. It comes in two ways. That, first of all, their clarity of the word and the gospel. I remember during seminary, as we're going through Lutheran Confessions 1, there was a friend of mine who was, I saw him on a Saturday, and he was reading the Confessions, and it was clearly not on what was the assigned reading. You know, that was kind of the, the rule. You read the reading as a sign, and then you do something else. And he was reading something else, and he was a, a man who did not grow up Lutheran. And I asked him, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? You know, you could watch a football game instead. And he says, when you look at the confessions and you apply them, it's like giving water to a man who is almost dying of thirst in the desert. He said, because they're so clear and they flood you in the grace of God. And that really, I think, hits to the heart of the whole thing is that when you read, when you apply the confessions, it gives someone complete clarity in a way that the world does not concise statement of what God's Word says in a world that is very bland when it comes to statements, and you always wonder what they actually mean. The confessions are very clear, especially when it comes to the gospel. And second of all, it provides pastors with the right teaching to apply and care. So this last Sunday, we had an ordination of a pastor, a local pastor, who was welcome to our area. And part of the rite when someone gets ordained is they ask them to pledge their confession of the Book of Concord. You know, go through the whole list, you read it all, Augsburg Confession, Apology, Large Catechism, Small Catechism, etc. And they ask, do you believe this? And he says, yes. And I think a lot of times we kind of stop there. Okay, he believes it, end of story, let's go. But it asks the question, will you perform the duties of your office in accordance with these confessions? Will your preaching and teaching and your administration of the sacraments be in conformity with this? We're not only asking the pastors to believe it, but also to preach it. So if it's very clear, which it is, about the gospel, which was a concern for all the reformers and the confessors, it is also something that when we are able to rightly apply it, which is what it's meant for, then the care of souls are at the forefront of everything we do when we go through it. And that's, like I said at the beginning, the confessions are about Jesus. And so what's our goal? Bringing Jesus to people and people to Jesus. And reflecting off of that and picking up on that as well, I think once again, it becomes a matter of correctly identifying what is the church here for? What is a pastor there for? And that's why it was really good that we started by identifying that the pastor is there for the care and cure of souls. And again, this is going to permeate everything that we talk about, especially in terms of the different topics and things that we're going to engage in this series. 
once again, drawing together from the Lutheran confessions, informing what we believe, teach, and confess on this, but it's still going to be centered on the care of souls because that's what the church exists for. Mm. You bring out the ordination. That was a huge insight to me when I was going through seminary that, hey, you're going to say this in front of the altar of God, and you always better mean what you say in front of the altar of God. And oh, by the way, you've said something similar to it when on the day of your confirmation, you said that you agree with this confession as taught to you from scripture and Luther's small catechism. Usually we just have there in the right, but also, and this was an insight that I got really when I got out into parish ministry, I followed the advice that they say and read the church constitution when you come into a parish and know what it says. And they're pretty similar. I mean, I think they kind of basically use a boilerplate constitution when you join the synod and so forth. And so a lot of them are similar, but almost all of them in the Lutheran Church of Missouri Synod list in mine and my dual parish here, it's Article 2. It basically lists the documents of the Lutheran Confession as what we subscribe to as the church. And then this was the insight that I got as I went through those constitutions of how many things in the Constitution relate back to what we believe, teach, and confess in those Lutheran Confessions, which are grounded on Scripture that it permeates how we look at what a member of this church is and how we remove a member and how we organize ourselves and decide what is okay in terms of being taught to our children in schools or in our Sunday school and how it informs just really everything that we do and usually even has a clause at the end of the Constitution that there are certain unalterable articles One, because they relate back to that article, which usually lists out the Lutheran confessions as being drawn from scripture. And as we can't change the word of God, we can't change that. But again, it just, it permeates everything that we do as church. So when we have that identity of this is who we are, this is what we're here for, it's for the care of souls, that's going to inform everything else that we do in the church. And I think that's just so foundational for our understanding. And so I like how you've brought that together here for us. This is all centered on the word of God and our right teaching, our right pastoral care is all going to be drawn from the word of God. And the, our Lutheran confessions have this focus. Our pastoral theology has this focus. Our ecclesiastical theology, you know, how we organize ourselves as church has this focus as well. And it all brings us to this point, which is what you said, bringing Jesus to people and people to Jesus. That's what the pastor is there for. That's what the church exists for. Fantastic. All right, we're going to take a break here. And on the other side of the break, we're going to pick up something that we've highlighted on this show as we've gone just straight through the Book of Concord quite a lot because our Lutheran confessions bring this point out a lot, is that it's all about the comfort of the conscience, especially Martin Luther and Philip Melanchthon and their writings that are contained in the Book of Concord bring out that line quite a lot. And so we want to talk about how this relates into this matter that we're discussing which is why Concord matters for the care of souls. How does the conscience fit into that? We'll pick that up on the other side of the break. You're listening to Concord Matters on KFUO. Ecclesiastes 10 verse 10 states, If the iron is blunt and one does not sharpen the edge, he must use more strength. But wisdom helps one to succeed. Find this true wisdom in Christ on Sharper Iron every weekday morning at 8 a.m. here on Worldwide KFUO. Sharpen the iron of your faith together with two pastors as they take up the sword of the Spirit to proclaim the gifts of Christ crucified and risen for you. Welcome back to Concord Matters as we continue talking with Pastor Brady Finnern of Messiah Lutheran Church in Sartell, Minnesota, talking about why Concord matters for the care of souls. Pastor Finnern doing an excellent job of walking us through what is the care of souls, how do the Lutheran confessions cross paths with that. And just before the break, we were coming right into this line that shows up quite a lot in the Lutheran confessions is that it's all about the comfort of the conscience and it's really focused on the conscience and the Lutheran reformers and confessors really come back to that idea quite a lot. And so I think that's a good place for us to pick up here then, Pastor Finnern, is how does the conscience fit into what we're talking about when it comes to the Lutheran confessions and the care of souls? 
So it's good for us to look at the conscience, because this is an important piece of the idea of caring for someone's soul. You say, I'm going to care for that person's soul, but for what purpose? And the goal is that people have a clear conscience before the Lord. And this is very well proclaimed in Scripture, especially by Paul with his letters to Timothy and to Titus, and also a little bit in the book of Acts, where it says explicitly, for example, 1 Timothy 1.5, The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. That's a good conscience is when you have faith and understanding of a good relationship with God. And he also speaks about it. A bad conscience, as he says in Titus chapter 1, is for those who are unbelievers and their consciences, he says, are defiled. Titus 1 verse 15. So this brings up the question, what's the conscience? In America, our problem is we think of it as on Pinocchio, where you hear, let your conscience be your guide, meaning how do I determine what is right or wrong? My conscience tells me. So that, I mean, if you want to talk about something confusing people left and right, that's going to be that because my conscience one day can say one thing and the next day another. We talk about the conscience, we're talking about how do I see my relationship with God? It's like a mirror that when you look in the mirror, if it's foggy, you're not able to see the fullness of what's there. But when you talk about relationship with others, you want to know exactly where you're at with another person. For example, when a parent every night goes to their child and says they love them and they're proud of them, whenever they do this, the child has a very clear understanding of their relationship. Mom and dad love me. They're proud of me. I know where we're at. And from there, they're able to live their life in accordance with their conscience. But if someone doesn't ever tell you that, you're always wondering, am I in a right relationship with this individual? And for us as Christians, we know that we have a good relationship with God on account of Christ. And so this is why the confessions, you really start to see and almost peel back a lot when you look at it and you realize that they just didn't want to write doctrinal statements. They had a very deep concern for the individual Christian to know that they had a good relationship with their Lord because of Christ. And this came to a head for me seven years ago when I was at a conference where Dr. John Kleinig, who is an Australian theologian, and he was talking about the care of souls, and he made a comment about the conscience, and he went through what I'm going through with you. And what he'd said was, if you were to read the Lutheran Confessions, you bring out your highlighter and highlight every time that the word conscience is used, you'd be shocked to see how often it's used. And it took me seven years to do it, but when COVID started, I decided I'm going to read through the confessions again. And then I started highlighting how often is the word conscience used. And clearly, I could have missed a number of them. And even if you go to the back of your Lutheran confessions, go to the back and to see how many references there are, you go to conscience, there's a lot of references. But what I counted is, counting all those, is that there's over 220 references to the conscience. Most prominently, they don't just use it as a side note. They use it as this is why we point people to Christ so that they will have a peaceful conscience with their Lord on account of Jesus. Now, with that, too, is often, not always, but often it is pointed back to the forgiveness of sins, which has just been a wonderful time these last four months reading through it because you're like, wow, look at that. The reformers really were thinking about the individual Christian, the people sitting in their pews. And at the same time, they never disconnected it from what we would deem to be one of the most important things in in the Christian life is the forgiveness of sins in Christ. This is not some old, out-of-touch thing. This is living and active and pointing us to everyday life that the conscience needs to know that they have a good relationship with God and they see it through Christ and his forgiveness. Once again, this is where it comes to fruition, bringing Jesus to people and people to Jesus. I give a hearty amen to all of that. I mean, this (laughs) is just seriously, it seems so simple. And we say it as pastors all the time. And I'll confess prior to my becoming a pastor as a layman sitting in the pews. And granted for me, that was a short time, mostly through college and high school and those sorts of things that I remember and everything. But I remember thinking this, you know, when it comes to theology and studying theology, I always thought, hey, that's really great if you're interested in those sorts of things, but I don't know how much this really matters for me. And this is where I've come around and started to see, not just because I'm a pastor, but especially one of the real focus of this show that I want to bring in 
is that this really does matter for the common Christian. Our Lutheran confession really does matter for the common Christian because it's exactly what you said. It's all about bringing Jesus to people and people to Jesus. It's about the forgiveness of sins to comfort our conscience. It's about all of those things that the church exists for that our Lord said, hey, this is for you to give you comfort in the midst of this world. And so I think it's interesting that you bring in that you went through that doing what Dr. Kleinig encouraged you to do. And for me, it just having this show and how often I read that kind of highlighted for me. But I think it's interesting that you did that during this whole COVID situation and so forth. Because again, I think that highlights the whole point of, hey, we live in a tragic, sin fallen world that is just not right. It's not the way it should be. In the midst of all of that, everything that's going on, hey, we live in the midst of this world where death is all around us. It could be waiting just around the corner for you the very next moment. In the midst of all of that, our Lord is good and gracious to give us the hope of everlasting life through the forgiveness of sins delivered to us in the church. That's what all of our theology is about. That's what our Lutheran confession is all about. And so we just want to continue to highlight that, especially as we go through this series, looking at the kind of different aspects of that. But I love how you're laying this groundwork for us really great here. All right, so that's soul care, the conscience, and the confessions, and where they cross paths and so forth. I think we've got some great building blocks here. How would you then say this plays out in concrete ways? Okay, so, you know, as we talk about everything in theology and the scriptures, is that it lays out in the law and the gospel. So, as we speak about the conscience, that relates to our relationship with God, because often, Our conscience can feel like, hey, I'm doing pretty well here. Actually, I'm God's pet. I go to church. I do this. And we lose track a little bit about who we are in light of God. And this is where the Word of God, the lamp to our feet and the light for our paths, enlightens our conscience to realize that we need God. That it's almost like a fog went over that mirror once again, and we're like, oh, I'm not that bad. Until you realize when the word hits you again and you realize against you, you only have I sinned and done what was evil in your sight, Psalm 51. And you see this specifically in the Ten Commandments. And I, you know, I reread the Ten Commandments and Small Catechism and the Large Catechism that you see in their full bore the reality that while we are not living in accordance with God's word, And you realize your need for God, specifically the Eighth Commandment. And I've gone through the small catechism with many, many people. And usually people are, they're they're not happy with things when they go through the first seven commandments. Okay, yeah, you know, I've done this. Yeah, you know, I maybe stole something when I was a kid. Yeah, I accidentally did this. But then you get to the Eighth Commandment where it says, We should fear and love God so we do not tell lies about our neighbor, betray him, slander him, or hurt his reputation. But defend him, speak well of him, and explain everything in the kindest way. That is when people, boom, realize, wow, I am not doing very well. That I am definitely needing God's help. I definitely need God. And the conscience becomes seared. I think almost every time I've gone through the Ten Commandments in the small catechism or for confirmation and so forth, I think I always end that night or that gathering with forgiveness (laughs) because you can just feel it in the room that it's there. So you see that throughout each part of the confessions. I'm not going to highlight them all, but you see that throughout, specifically in the Ten Commandments, to see that you need God and your conscience becomes enlightened. And this is a key thing here, too. It's not just that you feel comforted with God in the sense of that you know you're in a good relationship, but you realize you need that relationship, which is an important piece of our theology, which then leads us to the gospel. And the gospel doesn't partly enlighten it, it fully enlightens it to realize that our Lord was delivered for our trespasses and raised for our justification, and that we have a clear conscience before God on account of Christ. First of all, When you read through a lot of the confessions, you will hear this statement a lot, where it'll say either for Christ's sake, that we're forgiven for Christ's sake, or on account of Christ. And this is very intentional by the Lutheran confessors, because they don't ever want it to be something where people are wondering where their right relationship is. I'll give a few examples. So you see this in is the second article of the Creed, that he has redeemed me, a lost and condemned person, Purchased and won me from all sins, from death and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood and his innocent suffering and death. Right there tells us everything about our relationship with him. Why does he do it? That I may be his own. 
it shows us that the right relationship we have and you really see this on account of Christ on Augsburg Confession 4, Apology 4. And if you want to read something that you just constantly are led back to comfort in Christ, you read Augsburg Confession 4, the Apology, which is really, really, really long. And you can't help but realize that where is my hope? Where is my salvation? It is found on Christ. It says people are freely justified for Christ's sake when they believe they are received into favor for their sins are forgiven. And he says it again, for Christ's sake. It all comes back to that reality, showing us our need for God and then showing us what God provides for us freely and graciously on account of the Son of God. Yeah, I'm into that. The Apology of the Augsburg Confession, Article 4, is really, really, really long. But when we were doing the previous format of just reading through the Book of Concord and doing audio commentary, I think it took us a year and a half to get through that <laughs> Apology article. Excellent, but you summed up there really well for us and highlight it. Again, this really long article all centers us again in that we're spelling all of this out in great detail. Philip Melanchthon is writing that out, and we're having this discussion and debate, especially in the apology with the Roman confutation that was in response to our Augsburg confession. And we're continuing that discussion with the Roman church theologians because this stuff really matters when it comes again to the care of souls that the church exists for, to comfort our consciences centered on the gospel of Christ Excellent job in highlighting that for us, especially also bringing in law and gospel, which I'll make this point, uh, even with this new format, I'm not going to give up my walkabouts with Walther segments here on this show. <laughs> of course, bring in all the time the great work of CFW Walther, our first president in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, is his work on law and gospel. And again, as you're coming over from Germany and trying to immigrate into the United States, settle, set up a new community in Perry County, Missouri, directly across the river from where I'm sitting right now doing this show, in the midst of all of that going on, you got guys like CFW Walther who are using the Lutheran confessions and, of course, scripture, because the Lutheran confessions are well-grounded there, to deal with debates and theses and teach, and it's informing what they're doing in the community that they're setting up. Again, because it's all centered on the gospel and centered on the care of souls. And that's why the Lutheran confessions are so formative and important for what we believe, teach, and confess in the church, but then how we live right? That the practice, the actual things that we do in the church and the discussions we have with one another are all formed and shaped by this too. Once again, when we have the correct starting point and identify that starting point, which is we exist for the care of souls to deliver Christ's means of grace to people. And so I guess maybe that's the next good place to go to then is how does this impact our holy life in Christ or our sanctified life or just how we live as Christians? Let's put it that simply. Yeah, very good. So the conscience really, you're thinking about three things. The whole thing is, what's my relationship with God? And you realize your need for him. You realize the fullness of what it means to have Jesus on account of for the forgiveness of our sins. We have a right relationship with him. But also the conscience, after you realize that you're in a right relationship with him, is like, so what do we do? And this is important because we, as Christian people, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, want to know what to do. And one of the hardest things in life is when you don't know what to do. I was thinking about this this week because I've been helping the last two weeks with my son's flag football team. And, you know, I played high school football and I love football, but you show up and there's a certain amount of what do we do? Do we do drills now? Do we do this now? What do we do? Well, this is where God brings his word and the confessions are wonderful in this. You see it in, I would say, first of all, in prayer. This is where the introduction of the Lord's Prayer, for me, is one of the most powerful parts of the small catechism, where it says, Our Father who art in heaven, what does this mean? It not only shows us what to do, but it shows our relationship with God. It says, With these words, God tenderly invites us to believe that He is our true Father and that we are His true children. So with all boldness and confidence, we may ask Him as dear children ask their dear Father. So right away, you are shown the relationship with God, that we have a true father and that we are his true children. And so as a father will listen to his child, and we pray for this as fathers, that he loves and redeems and calls them his own, that we are able to come to him as dear children as their dear father. 
And a dear father would allow their child to kind of ramble a little bit. Their dear father would allow them to say anything to them. And so I think that really encompasses this holy life is to know that our conscience, we know we're with God, so we're able to come to him with absolutely anything. And as it continually tells us, on account of Christ and for Christ's sake, we have a clean mirror before God, and we know that we can live this life in freedom with a clear conscience to live freely, to live a holy life. And there's tons of references in this. You have the new obedience. You'll see this in the Augsburg Confession. And I always like to go back to simplicity, but you see it in the small catechism that at the end of each of the commandments, it gives us a clear conscience of how do we now live. So, for example, second commandment, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. But what should we do? Call upon him in every trouble, pray, praise, and give thanks. Third commandment, um, remembering the Sabbath, what should we do? Hold the word of God sacred and gladly hear it and learn it. And you go down the whole list. Husbands and wives love and honor each other. Help your neighbor improve and protect their possessions and income. What do we do when we're tempted to give false testimony against our neighbor? Well, explain everything in the kindest way. Coveting, when you covet, what should we do? No, urge people to stay and to protect their possessions and income. All of these things give us that, I guess you would say, the first step for us to live that holy life so that we know our conscience is clear to then go do holy things. What am I supposed to do? I'll do this. God clearly gives it to us. And that'd be another fascinating thing for me is to see how, because I'm a child of God, to next time read the whole confessions with what is the direction he gives us with a clear conscience. I'm not sure how I'm going to highlight that, but I think that'd be a really neat thing for us to be able to do is to be able to look at the confessions and say, how do I live this holy life with obviously a clear conscience? Even as I just reflect on that, of course, you brought in, we could talk about the new obedience, which of course shows up in Augsburg Confession, Article 6. I think it shows up in all the good works articles as well, which, you know, is all throughout the formula of Concord. Third use of the law in the formula of Concord, I think would also apply in there. And well, but even as I'm just jumping out here to political order in Augsburg Confession article, uh, what is that? Is it 16, I think? And then the apology also as well. And then just, again, what we do in life and what we think about a political order and its relation to the church. And it's not just good works, new obedience and things like that, but then it impacts very specific things as well. I think that would be a really fascinating sort of approach. And again, is kind of the idea behind this series that we're going to be doing is we're starting with something really big, which is the church exists for the care of souls. And our Lutheran confessions are focused on that centered on the gospel, the divine grace delivered to us in and through the church. That's what our theology all centers on. And so as we engage some of these specific topics, we're going to get a little more specific then and focusing on, okay, this is what we then do since our soul is cared for, and how do we care for others in this way? And that's kind of relating back again to what I saw, even as I go through church constitutions and so forth. What does our evangelism committee exist for? What does our board of education exist for? What does our board of trustees exist for? It's all to help us fit together to be church with this confession to deliver the care of souls, Christ's care for your soul, to give you a clear conscience. You're just doing a fantastic job of that. And again, I think that's our focus in the Lutheran Confessions, and it plays out in all of these very specific things that we have to talk about as well. All right, so with about uh, six, seven minutes left here, bring this kind of to a conclusion for us then. How do we bring all of this together that we're talking about here, the Lutheran Confessions, that Concord matters for the care of souls, Bring that all to a wrap for us. Okay, uh, I bring two things. First of all, looking at the Lutheran confessors and where they really found the conscience to be very important is explicitly speaking about the importance of the clear conscience for people, which obviously points us to the care of souls. And when I read through this, I really found three themes. Now, a reminder, this is a really a lifelong process for me to study. And so this is maybe not as deep or there's probably some PhDs out there on this somewhere. But this is what I'm noticing is there's three times that you'll see the Lutheran confessors really hit home on the need for a clear conscience. Number one is justification. They're continually speaking about people needing peace of conscience. 
and they are just fighting explicitly of other people who are trying to give people a seared conscience when they don't need to do that. And so when you talk about especially the Augsburg Confession and the Apology, and you see it in the formula, that they are very much so speaking about the conscience over and over again to make sure that people know that they are justified in Christ. And number two, interesting enough, is repentance. That there was an obvious concern for people seeing repentance not only as my work, because that is a tendency, that we will try to call people to repentance and act only them doing it not as a gift from God. And a lot of times people were seeing it as their source of hope for salvation. And so that's another thing we got to remember, too, that when we are preaching repentance is a soul care issue, but to keep it in light of the gospel and the light of God's work in their life. And it's not the end of the story. Repentance always leads us back to the cross. And the third part was the Lord's Supper. This one is over and over again. If you go back to the end of the confessions and look up the conscience, you'll see a lot of references of the Lord's Supper, that they had a lot of abuses of the Lord's Supper, that people were almost coming to the body and blood in fear that they were doing something wrong and not as a source of forgiveness or as a beginning of something as opposed to the ending statement of God. And that's an important piece, too, is how can we always be faithful in how we present the Lord's Supper to people? And all these things come down to this as pastors. To be a Zalesorger is incredibly complex, but it's also incredibly simple. So it's complex because of all the things that are going on in people's lives and our own. All of that, we are to be attentive listeners. Dr. Sinkbao talks a lot about being a sheepdog, that it is Jesus who is our shepherd, and we are like a sheepdog that continually keep our eyes centered on him. And when he gives us direction, we move forward. And that direction is to listen to people, to listen attentively to what they have need of, and to be able to apply that law and gospel. And the confessions are such a huge source of, or a flood of grace upon us to be able to apply it correctly. They were able to give people clarity in a world that is really, it's really messy. That in people's lives where they're wondering what's right or wrong, they are able to hear it clearly from the Word of God. And when they are, have spiritual illness, we are able to be that physician that when we preach the gospel, that when we give forgiveness, then we give the sacraments, we are able to say with full joy and with full assurance that we are doing what God has called us to do because we are bringing Jesus to people and people to Jesus, as it tells us, for Christ's sake and faith, they are received into favor and their sins are forgiven for Christ's sake. That is a comfort for me to know that we subscribe to these confessions and they're incredibly practical in each person that we care for in God's kingdom. Excellently confessed there. I love how you brought that all together, highlighting the chief article upon which the church stands and falls, justification, obviously centered on the care of souls, repentance, not some abstract theology out there that we just want to write a whole big thesis on and so forth. No, repentance relates to our relationship to Christ and his care for our soul in and through the church, through our pastor. The Lord's Supper, that's an excellent point as well. I love that. I mean, one of the articles is, you know, about receiving in both kinds, receiving the bread and the wine. We discuss that in the church because, again, it matters in terms of the care of our souls because of what the Lord's Supper delivers to us. Excellent job. Any parting thoughts for you before we leave today? No, just pastors, people, everybody. Let's keep bringing Jesus to people and people to Jesus. That's it. That is well confessed. Thank you, Pastor Brady Finnern, for joining us for Concord Matters today and discussing with us why Concord matters for the care of souls. And thank you, dear listener, for stopping by today. And until next time, keep confessing, church.